This is a quick reconstruction of my first talk, the overview of the whole course. As a, the course is going to be mainly about explanation. In explanation, you have something that you have to explain. That's called the exp explanandum. And then you have something that, that you explain it with. And the object is that you should understand something that you didn't understand before. Often it means you can do something. You could uh, Either you, you could do something or else you know how to do something that you didn't know how to do before. So explanation is largely causal explanation. Introspection was the way that... Uh, that um, the 19th century and earlier thought psychology was uh, meant to be done. Uh, you were meant to sit in your uh, armchair and think, and then think about how it is that you think, and that was meant to explain how your mind worked. Unfortunately, uh, you can't figure out how your mind works. You can't explain how your not mind works just by sitting in an armchair and thinking about it. Uh, one of the reasons you can't do it is because when you're thinking about it, you're sort of observing. Uh, you are the observer of what's going on around you. And um, it's important that you should explain what's going on inside the observer rather than just do the observations. Because if you're doing the observations, uh, you're begging the question. The explanation that you're looking for is, how is it that I'm able to do all the things that I can do? And evidently, just thinking about how I do all the things that I do, at least thinking about it in an armchair, won't tell me, won't explain it. Some observations obviously have to be made, but the right observations are not the ones that you make in an armchair, but they're rather similar to observations in all other areas of um, science, if you like, or, or empirical research, which is they're observations that you make in the world, and the reason it's important you should be able to make them in the world is because other people should be able to repeat them and confirm them. So it's not just you. What you, what you discover when you're sitting in your armchair is open only to you. Descartes made perhaps the most important... Uh, he didn't make it, but he, he was the one who formalized the most important distinction underlying everything in cognitive science, and that's um, what, what his cogito expresses what uh, what he pointed out was that there are there are, um, things that you can be sure of and there are things that you can't be sure of the things that you can be sure of are the truths of mathematics which you can prove mathematics and logic those are true on pain of if they were false it would lead to a contradiction so they're true true on pain of contradiction uh, whereas the things that science tells you, unlike mathematics, are also true. He said, but Descartes and the skeptics, are they're not hard skeptics. They don't say the things that you can't be sure about are not true. All they say is that the things that you can't be sure about are not certainly true, not necessarily true. And, uh, unlike the truths of mathematics, the truths of science, like that apples fall and that F equals MA and all of the other things that you've learned in science, are, are true, but you can't be 100% certain that they're true. And then he asked himself, so there's some doubt, there's always a tiny bit of doubt that you can raise about any uh, scientific truth that you can't raise about a mathematical truth. And so he asked, is there anything else that I can be just as sure about as I can about mathematics? And it turned out there was one other thing, and that was about the very fact that he was thinking or doubting. Um, cogito ergo sum just says, I th I'm thinking. Uh, there, I mean, the way he put it originally was, I'm think I think, therefore I am. That's a little bit too... Um, it's a little bit too elaborate, but what you can be sure of is that while you're thinking, there's thinking going on. And if even if you're a little bit uncertain about what you mean by thinking, let's pick something that is really beyond doubt, and that is when you're feeling something, whatever it feels like, you can be certain that you're feeling something that feels like that, not something else. For example, if you have a toothache, uh, you can't be certain that you have a tooth. You can't be certain that there's something wrong with your tooth. You can't be certain that can't even be certain that there's a world out there. But you can be certain that what you're feeling, namely, it feels like my tooth hurts, or, or feel, it feels like a toothache. I don't want to make too much of a theory about what a tooth is and a mouth is and what causes toothaches. It feels like a toothache, that familiar feeling of a toothache. That you can be sure about, that you're feeling that. Or better still, don't even be so specific. When you're feeling something, you can be sure that you're feeling something. Something is being felt. That's the uh, Cartesian cogito. It's the, it's the heart of introspection, 
uh, but it's extremely elusive, and it even led to the so-called mind-body problem, according to which there are, there are hard and easy uh, questions to answer. The, hard, the easy questions are the kinds that science answers, including psychology, namely how, how does the brain work, how does the body do what it can do, and so forth. Those are uh, easy questions, most of them unanswered. And then the hard question is, how come that all that stuff Whatever the causal explanation of all that stuff is, how come that, that it feels like something to be a, a system that can do all that stuff? That's the mind-body problem. Uh, it's usually described as a, I mean, it's usually characterized as kind of a, 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 a difficulty in putting together mental and physical things. Uh, let's switch, let's replace mental and physical by feeling and doing and it's easy to explain doing, that's the easy problem. It's hard to explain feeling, uh, not in the sense of weather prediction. I mean, you can, you can probably, by looking at somebody's facial expression, you can tell whether they're angry or sad, and you're probably right. And eventually, probably brain um, imaging will be able to tell you exactly. Uh, I mean, not exactly, we'll, we'll be able to tell you uh, with 100% accuracy whether somebody's angry or, or, uh, or happy, no matter what they say and no matter what they do with their faces. It's kind of a lie detector. But that's not an explanation, that's just a predictor, like weather prediction. Uh, the mind-body problem is how do we explain the fact that we feel? Why do we feel? How, do, how is it that we feel? What is, uh, uh, physically, what, uh, how is it that, that uh, uh, physical processes which we can understand as explaining what we can do, how come those processes also feel like something? That's the mind-body problem. Behaviorism was an attempt to explain what psychology, what we now call cognitive science, meant to explain, but the trouble is that it didn't really explain it. It just, uh, it just uh, showed you the history, or studied the history that would lead to an outcome. For example, if I eventually know what apples are, behaviorism will, uh, will um, study what kind of a history of having been rewarded for calling apples apples or eating apples and, and being punished for, or, or at least not rewarded for, not calling non-apples apples and not eating non-apples, what kind of a history of, of reward and punishment would have led me to eventually call apples apples and non-apples non-apples, but it doesn't explain what kind of a system I have to be in order to be able to learn, given the kinds of input that I get, what's an apple and what's not an apple. That's the real heart of cognitive science, is explaining all of those capacities that we have, not how they're shaped by reward and punishment. It's interesting that it can be reached, shaped by reward and punishment, but how is it that we, what is it that we have to be, what kind of a mechanism do we have to be in order to be able to be shaped by reward and punishment, the way that behaviorism sorts it out. And behaviorism said, uh, not only is it a scientific mistake to introspect, to, to try to, um, to try to, uh, use what happens when you're paying attention to what's going on in your head in an armchair, to use that as if it were data. We have to really look at data that everybody can observe and everybody can observe behavior. That they were right about. But they also said that unobservable things shouldn't figure in the explanation. And that's, of course, nonsense. The explanation isn't just observing behavior and then observing the rewards and the punishments and then cataloging the history. It's explaining what kind of a mechanism um, something uh, a, a system has to be in order to be able to learn. It's a kind of reverse engineering. We have these mechanisms. We don't know how they work. We have to figure out how they work by uh, sort of uh, deconstructing them and then trying to construct another system that can do what they can do. Back again to observables. The, the um, observables are there, and in behaviorism, the observable is what organisms do and uh, their inputs and their outputs. But the explanation involves a mechanism which is not directly observable, which we have to figure out the same way we figure out everything else, including theoretical physics. I mean, theoretical physics, the, the observables of physics don't wear the theory of Newton or the theory of uh, relativity on their sleeves. You have to figure that out, and then you have to test it to see whether it actually works. Um, the, probably the father of cognitive psychobiology was D.O. Hebb right here at McGill, and uh, his idea was that uh, what you want to do, what your, what your theory has to be, has to be it has to be a um, neural theory. It has to explain what the processes are in the brain that give rise to the things that we study in psychology, behavior as well as mental states. So he was 
in principle interested in both the easy problem and the hard problem, but he was interested in really solving it by doing the reverse engineering, which he felt was mainly neuroscience, uh, in order to find the mechanism that can do everything we can do, and also to explain how it is that we can feel everything we can feel. Uh, neuroscience, of course, was, was already there before Hebb. It's, uh, I would say that um, Hebb was the father of cognitive neuroscience, or cognitive uh, psychobiology. But at the same time that people were getting, were getting tired of behaviorism, which wasn't, what, wasn't explaining anything, and starting to pay attention to the brain, uh, computation was also, c compu uh, computational theory was also growing in artificial intelligence. And um, people in artificial intelligence started to write programs uh, and even make robots sometimes, but certainly do some, some uh, programs that could do the kinds of things that until then only human beings had been able to do. So to a first approximation, uh, a computer science program or even a mechanism for a robot is a theory. It's kind of a, a partial reverse engineering of what it is that, that we can do. And so it counts as a theory of uh, the mechanism. Just as any successful explanation of a brain mechanism would be a theory, if, if the brain mechanism generated the capacity, then that would be a theory. In the same way, a, an artificial intelligence um, model that can do what we can do is at least one explanation of how it is that anything could do what we can do. And in the end, cognition is whatever internal processes uh, are required in order to do what cognizers like us, the people that are capable of cognition, can do. That means everything our bodies can do, that's the easy problem, as well as the fact that we feel, and that's the hard problem. The explanation has to be causal, and causality is already uh, illustrated by Newtonian mechanics. When, when, a, when a billiard ball is hit, it hits, uh, pardon me, let's leave out what, how it's hit, because uh, if you put in a human being, you're already putting psychology in there. But let's say there is a, a landslide, and then the landslide ends up hitting this cue stick, which hits one of the billiard balls, which hits another billiard ball, and so on and so forth. Newton, Newton explains the causal chain from the, wherever you want to join it, from the Big Bang, the beginning of the universe, or just at the, at the beginning of the landslide, or when the cue stick got hit. But in any case, it has a mechanical explanation of how it is that one thing causes, one dynamic event leads to another dynamic event causally. That's the kind of explanation we'd like. It's, it's uh, the uh, machines like, like automobiles and and airplanes as well as robots and computers are all causal devices and so we want their devices just like waterfalls their uh, waterfalls and, and uh, um, solar systems big ones uh, planetary systems all of these are causal systems and we want to know how they work and in the case of the autonomous kinds of causal systems that are on the earth and that we built we, re we engineer them and we give an engineering explanation. That's a dynamical causal explanation. In the case of natural organisms like us, we didn't build them. We, 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 we grew naturally, but we, ne we still need that kind of an explanation. How, what is it? What is the causal mechanism that gives these systems the capacity to do what they can do? And the, ex the causality has to be, in the end, very much like uh, mechanical and electromechanical and, and molecular causality that everything else is. Another ongoing thing, of course, is evolution. The fact is that on, the, on Earth, not perhaps elsewhere in the universe, nobody knows, but certainly on Earth, there's something um, special going on in the sense that um, the blind watchmaker, that's evolution itself, a, a, a blind system that, that, um, that favors uh, genotypes. A genotype is a... Is a um, is a mechanism that can code for certain traits, certain properties. Uh, for example, uh, having wings is something that's genetically encoded in the genome. Once you have a gene that codes for wings, and all you have to do is, uh, is go, it, it has to grow in the usual developmental way, and in the end, the organism has wings, and flying is a behavior, and if, to the extent that flying behavior has some behavior patterns <coughs> already inborn, then even the behavior has a a structure in the genome, and evolution is the one that shaped the genome. And the way that it shaped it was that the kinds of traits that helped a gene, the pardon me, the organism that 
had the gene in it. The kinds of traits that helped the organism survive and reproduce were the ones that, uh, that uh, were passed on. And so they were the ones that stayed in the population. The kinds of genes that didn't help or that harmed or that didn't do as well as the competitor um, disappeared. That's the blind watchmaker. And all of our um, um, structural and functional and behavioral traits that are inborn are shaped by evolution. So a certain, ex a certain part of the explanation of cognition will be the explanation of how it is that cognitive systems evolved. I've already spoken about reverse engineering. It's about taking systems that are already there, unlike regular engineering where you, where you try to build them and in building them you figure out how to make them work. In this case, they're already built, they already work, it's the blind watchmaker who built them and the reverse engineers have to figure out how they work and one of the ways, to, the, 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 the most effective way, and in fact the only certain way of testing whether it, uh, an explanation of how they work works is to build something according to the explanation and see if it works, see if, see if it can actually do what you say that it can do. So the idea in the case of, uh, for cognitive science is to reverse engineer our cognitive capacities, come up with a model that can do what we can do, and then that, that'll be an explanation of, what, of how we do it. Uh, that was the introduction, that was the first uh, talk. The second talk will be about, uh, about the theory of computation. One of the candidates for, for um, what the mechanism of cognition is, what it is that makes us able to do all we can do, is, is co computation. And so the second talk, uh, the second uh, lecture in this course was about Turing and the theory of what computation is. The third lecture is uh, Searle's Chinese Room Argument showing that in fact, whereas computation is useful and no doubt is part of uh, uh, cognition, it can't be all of cognition. Uh, the Turing test <clears throat> sort of may, it's the, it's the program for all of cognitive science, if you like. The Turing test says, build me a device that can do everything a, a, a cognizer, a human cognizer can do, and do it so well that another human, a real human, can't tell it apart from a human being in what it can do, not in what it looks like, but in what it can do, and you've... Um, you've basically solved cognitive science. That's the Turing test, and that's Turing's program for cognitive science. Um, there are some questions, however, and, and we raised them in the, four, in the fifth session, about uh, the brain. I mean, the brain obviously is doing it, uh, so the natural thing would be to, to say, let's figure out how the brain works, and that'll tell us how cognition works. And in principle, that's right. The trouble is that the brain is an organ like the heart, and it doesn't wear on its sleeve how it is that it works. The heart does, because the heart uh, is doing something, if you like, structural, something that you can observe, and it's fairly simple. It's pumping blood, and you can look at its anatomy, and you can see how it manages to pump blood, and then you can model it, and you can show that, yes, this model can do what the heart can do. But with the brain, it's a matter of building a model that can do everything we can do. And that's why it's the Turing test that's the critical um, test, and not whatever it is that we can figure out what the brain does, what the, what the brain does within the, within the brain, you know, what stimulates what, what's active, neuroimagery, pharmacology, etc. They're all very informative about the brain as an organ, just like the kidney and the uh, lungs. But unlike the kidney and the lungs, there's a huge domain of brain function that is not sitting there inside your head. It's the stuff that your body can do. And it's very difficult by peeking and poking at the brain to figure out how it is that it can do all of the things that, the, that, that it can do. So it, it probably makes more sense to try to reverse engineer, reverse engineer the capacities themselves directly. Use the brain, of course. If the brain gives you some clues as to how to get the job done, then of course the clues are welcome. And if they turn out to be right, hooray. But just uh, continuing to study the brain without um, trying to turn it into a working model of what the body can do, um, so far hasn't really led to much uh, progress in passing uh, the Turing test and in explaining cognition. The symbol grounding problem tries to uh, explain why it is that Searle's Chinese room argument is right. Searle's Chinese room argument says that if, you, if uh, someone um, were to execute a computer program to implement a computer program that passes the Turing test in Chinese. Uh, for example, if Searle the philosopher did that, if there were a computer program that could uh, act as a pen pal uh, for a lifetime with you 
without you ever noticing that it's not really a, a person. And, in, and if it could do that in Chinese, and you were Chinese, so Chinese people couldn't tell that it wasn't a real Chinese person. Whereas in reality, it was Searle that was, do, that was executing the computer program. And Searle, of course, could tell you truly, but look, I'm doing all of this, but I haven't got an idea of what I'm doing. I'm not, I'm not understanding Chinese. Then you would be wrong to assume that a, a Chinese understanding computer program was ever understanding Chinese. Searle is just another implementation of the Chinese understanding program, and Searle doesn't understand, so therefore computation isn't enough to capture cognitive capacities like understanding, meaning, and so on. The symbol grounding problem suggests that the reason this is the case is because of the nature of computation. Computation is just the manipulation of meaningless uh, symbols according to their shape. Now, this is very powerful, and, and the Church Turing thesis is the thesis that says just about anything that, in fact, every, anything that a human mind can compute, um, a computer can compute. And probably, the Church Turing thesis says that probably just about every physical system can be simulated by a computational uh, model. But that doesn't mean that everything is computation. And uh, in particular, the meaning of a symbol, what it means, in the case of cognition, you're going to have to talk about the meanings of symbols. The meaning of the symbol is not part of the computation. The computation can be interpreted as meaning something, but in itself, all it is based on is shaping, is manipulating uh, symbols on the basis of their shapes. And the best illustration of this is, if you don't know how to speak to uh, speak Chinese and somebody, uh, and you ask somebody, what does this word mean in Chinese? Let's say miraculously you, you can pronounce it and you can and you can read the symbol and, and, and pronounce it, but you don't know what it means. So you say, what does ban ma mean? And then somebody says, well, f somebody Chinese says, fine, uh, uh, here's the, the definition. They'll give you the je definition, but the definition itself will also be in Chinese. And then you say, but I don't understand. They say, okay, fine. Well, I, I just define ban ma. If there's some words in the definition that you don't understand, let's look them up too. But when you look them up, the same thing happens. It's just meaningless squiggles and squaggles. That's the symbol grounding problem. That whereas the dic dictionary itself can be systematically interpreted as meaning what every word in Chinese means, or if it's in English, it means everything that English means, the symbols and the symbol manipulations themselves are not enough to get you to meaning. So the question is, what is? And the tentative answer is sensory motor categorization capacity. If not for all the symbols in the Chinese dictionary, but for enough of the symbols in the Chinese dictionary, you are able to pick out and, and manipulate and interact with and describe the objects and the events and the actions and the states that the symbols refer to, then, um, then uh, those sensory motor capacities ground your symbols. Now it's no longer true that the symbols are just meaningless squ squiggles and squaggles, or at least the connection between the squiggles and the squaggles and the things that the squiggles and the squaggles are referring to is, is um, directly made by the sensory motor capacity, the robotic capacity. It doesn't depend on an external interpreter supplying an interpretation the way that we have to do with computation. So this provides grounding, whether it grounds symbols, whether and it gets you out of the uh, Searle's Chinese room because Searle cannot use his Chinese room argument against a robotic system. He can only use it against a purely symbolic system. S uh, computation is implementation independent. Searle can be the computer program that passes the Chinese Turing test, but he can't be the robot unless he really is um, um, functioning in the world and using Chinese words uh, correctly to apply to objects. And of course, then he would... Uh, if it were Searle, he would certainly be understanding. But if it were a robot doing it, it's not clear that a robot would be understanding. It's possible that the robot would simply be grounded, but that it wouldn't be understanding. And then the question is, what's the difference between grounding and understanding? They sound like the same thing. I mean, if a robot is walking around pointing at, to apples and saying, look, that's an apple, can't you see? It's red, etc., etc. Surely that's understanding. Well, maybe, but um, we're back to the hard problem. What's missing is... For, the, for, for, for any of us to believe that the robot is really understanding rather than just acting, we have to say that the robot feels what it is that I feel when I understand what Apple means. In other words, there has to be somebody home inside the robot, just like Descartes said, feeling something. 
And that's the hard problem, explaining why it is that a robot that can pass uh, the Turing test uh, would feel it's, it, it would be grounded, it wouldn't just be squiggles and squaggles, there's no question about that, it would be grounded, but would it really have a mind? Um, we go deeper in the sec seventh session into what categorization is and uh, categorical perception, which is the, uh, the, um, the tendency for categories that, uh, that uh, for things that belong to the same category to look more alike physically, to be sort of compressed compared to um, things that are in a different category, more compressed. Obviously, black is, is different. Different blacks are more alike than different whites are, and there's a bigger difference between black and white than there is between blacks and between whites. But um, that's a case where nature has already put a huge separation between the two, and then there we don't need to have any further compression. But in the case of the colors of the rainbow, for example, reds look more alike than they look like yellows, and, but, but uh, the physical difference between different shades of red, different wavelengths, may be exactly the same as the physical difference between a shade of red and a shade of yellow. If you look along, the spectrum is a continuum. You're going continuously from short wavelengths to, to long wavelengths, and yet you have these bands of color, and during the, in the bands there's these compressed regions where everything looks qualitatively the same. That's categorical perception. That happens when you're learning to categorize things and uh, it's a hard problem, and your, your, your perceptual system needs to somehow sharpen up its ability to tell apart the members from the non-members. That's when you get categorical perception. I'll talk about that when we summarize the seventh session. The eighth session is about evolution and cognition. There's no question, as we said before, that, that our cognitive capacities didn't just pop out of uh, the Big Bang. They evolved um, in the history of our species. And the question is, what can evolution tell us about cognition? It can tell us a lot about things like, like sexual preferences, sex differences, reproductive strategy, etc. The, 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 uh, the more um, challenging question is, what can it tell us about cognition? Uh, one fundamental question about cognition is how language began, because if there's one thing that sets us apart from all of the other species, it's the fact that we can talk. And in fact, when it comes to categories, Language gave us a second, radically new way of learning categories. Apart from the categories that we're born with, there, which are few, there are many categories that we learn. All of the entries in our dictionaries and encyclopedias are the names of most of them, are the names of categories that we've learned rather than categories that we were born with. How did we learn them? We learned them by trial and error, by, 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 by classifying them one way or the other way, and, and there are consequences of misclassifying them. Uh, either by one way of misclassifying things is to eat something that's poisonous. Well, that was a mistake. You can't, eating it was the wrong thing to do. If you don't die, but you just get sick and you get to do it often enough, you eventually learn what to eat and what not to eat. And this is true about uh, all categories. You learn what's an apple and what's not an apple. Eventually, you learn... Well, once you have language, it's not just what you do with it practically that, that is the category name, if you like. Eating edible things and not eating inedible things is a kind of a way to categorize them. But with language, you just have an arbitrary label. And what language allowed us to do, once it began, was to learn new categories without having to go through all of the risk and the time and, and, the, and, the, time and the trouble of uh, trial and error, eating something that was poisonous and getting a little sick, etc. If somebody already knows what's edible and what the features of the edible thing, thing, uh, things are, they can tell us. And then in one sentence, they've saved us maybe hours or years of, of, uh, of trial and error and possibly risk and death. So there was a huge advantage in having evolved language. The question is, how did it evolve? That's the ninth session. Um, language is two things. It's syntax, which is uh, rules of grammar, and it's semantics, which is meaning. And uh, one of the surprising consequences of the uh, very um, rich work that has been done by Noam Chomsky and his uh, colleagues at MIT in the last 40 or 50 years is that there is a universal grammar that underlies all possible human languages. It's a grammar that we're not taught in school, and in fact, we don't even recognize it when, when we're taught the rules. They're really quite uh, bizarre, unfamiliar rules. And also, uh, the theory isn't even complete, so we don't even know all of the rules, but, but what we do know uh, 
is that um, those rules were not learned either by instruction or by trial and error because the child, when, they're, when the child first begins to learn to speak, uh, starts to speak in conformity with those rules. They, the, everything they say and everything they hear agrees with those rules. And yet, if you give them, when they get a little bit older, if you give them sentences that, that the Chomskyan linguists have, uh, there's an infinity number of, a number of sentences, an infinite number of sentences that the Chomskyan linguists, linguists have discovered that are not grammatical, but that we're never taught are not grammatical. We never hear them. We're never corrected on them. And yet we have the capacity to generate all and only the grammatically correct ones. Chomsky was the first one to raise the question about what, what is this ability. He's asking about a, a cognitive ability, and in fact it's a categorization ability. It's a cap capacity to categorize well-formed and, and, and not well-formed utterances, the utterances that agree with what eventually got called the universal grammar, and the ones that don't. And the surprising thing is that um, it's not possible to learn universal grammar from the... Um, from the data available to the child, which means that universal grammar had to be inborn in the brain. This produces evolutionary problems, and we'll be discussing that in the 10th session. Um, the 11th session is back to the, um, the mind-body problem and the explanatory gap. It will talk about why, uh, about how the, the real question, once we've, a once we've answered all the easy questions of cognition, once we've got past the Turing test, and once we've got a device that can do everything that we can do, it's natural to say, all right, fine. How do we know that it feels just, it feels at all, just the way we feel? I'm not talking about whether it feels the same kind of things we do, but whether it feels at all. And second of all, why does it feel? How does it feel and why does it feel? It seems as if the Turing explanation that will tell us how it is that we can do everything we can do should ba basically explain everything, including all of the things it takes to survive and to reproduce and to get, a, get by in life. Why and how is feeling generated and why is it necessary in any of that? That's the mind-body problem and it's the explanatory gap. It's a hard problem and I actually think it's insoluble. Uh, finally, we go to the um, wider notion of cognition. Most, most of the cognition we've been talking about uh, so far has been within the ears and inside uh, the brain uh, or inside the robot. But you can also say that uh, there's an awful lot of um, cognitive-like stuff out there. We have books, we have libraries, we have now the internet and so on, uh, the World Wide Web. Has that kind of made a distributed mind? That's the kind of question we're going to be discussing in the 12th session. And then finally, I'll give an overview in the 13th session. So this is just a quick uh, sort of, a, 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 I didn't run up and down the stair staircases for an hour before I gave this, so it was quite quickly done. This is just a, by way of review for you for the midterm or maybe even the final um, as an overview of the course. Now I'm going to do it separately for each of the sessions that we did, also breathlessly like this.